the 16 things Noah will tell you about e-bikes from someone who has tested over 50. Over the past couple of days, I have had tons of neighbors come through my garage and I've explained to them all about e-bikes because I was offering a sale on the ones that I no longer needed or wanted. And I really only needed a couple of bikes, right? And so I've tested over 50 e-bikes from the ridiculous to the super impractical, but awesome. And from even super practical. There are so many different kinds of e-bikes. It can be a little overwhelming to decide which one is right for you. So I decided I'd put together the guide of the best things that I have learned after testing 50 plus e-bikes that no one else will tell you. Keep on watching to find out more. Now e-bikes have risen in popularity just like the electric car. They are a great alternate mode of transportation. In fact, I actually didn't need an e-bike or have a real like purpose for one. I just thought they were super cool and wanted to test one out. And so that's exactly what I did. I reached out to Ride Power Bikes after I started this website and wanted to do an honest review of their bikes. And so that's how I got started in this whole journey of e-bikes. Number one lesson, no such thing as the perfect e-bike. Let me tell you the one thing that I've learned after testing 50 plus e-bikes. There is no, you heard me correctly, there is no such thing as the perfect e-bike, but there probably is the perfect e-bike for you. So let's dive in, let's talk about all the different kinds of e-bikes and how to find the perfect e-bike for you. Now, the number one way to figure out what the perfect e-bike is for you is to first decide how you're gonna use your electric bike. So if you're someone that wants to just ride on streets, there's probably an e-bike for you. Someone that wants to do more serious mountain biking, there's probably an e-bike for you. If you need something that's super lightweight, there's probably the perfect e-bike for you. Now you can't have super lightweight and super heavy duty, you know, off-roading capabilities in the same package with fat tires, you're just not gonna find it, right? Number two, different types of electric bikes. So there are a couple of different kinds of e-bikes and there's a couple ways to look at it. The first is just by function, right? Just like a normal bike, there are mountain bikes, there's street bikes, there's everything in between, there's cargo e bikes, and so, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is by the classification. So classifications are one, two, and three for e-bikes. Class one e-bikes go 20 miles an hour with pedal assist and do not have a throttle. They're mostly, and I say mostly, there's always exceptions to the rule, but they're mostly more street type bikes that are class one e-bikes, at least that we've tested. Some of the Trek bikes are class one e-bikes. Pedal assist gives you that little extra oomph, and I'll talk more about that in just a second, so keep watching. But there is no throttle on a class one e-bike. Class two e-bikes also go up to 20 miles an hour through pedal assist, but also offer a throttle. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but I'd say 99% of trails require your e-bike to be a class one or a class two e-bike. Hold on to that thought for just a second. A class three e-bike has pedal assist and throttle and can go up to 28 miles an hour. You see, you may be wondering, okay, what do I need? A class one, class two, class three? I mean, unless you are a daredevil, I would encourage everyone to look at a class two e-bike. And that's because you just want a throttle at some points. For example, when I do a lot of these reviews, I cross a very busy street in my neighborhood and I love using throttle because it allows me to get across the street incredibly fast. And I also like to start with the throttle, especially on these heavier, big fat tire e-bikes. And so I recommend people look at a class two e-bike. Most class two e-bikes can actually be upgraded to a class three e-bike by doing like a Nintendo style controller switch, like up, down, right, left, right, left, up, down. 
You can do a follow sequence in the controller. You can usually look it up online and you can usually make most class two e-bikes a class three e-bike and no one's on the trail doing, you know, speedometer checks or anything like that. But just don't be a jerk. Just if you're on the trail with other people, don't be going 30 miles an hour when everyone's going five. Don't be on super crowded trails and just blaze your way through it. Just don't be an idiot and it won't be a problem. Number three, everything you need to know about range. Now the next thing that everyone always asks about, especially if I'm talking to new people about bikes, is they just don't understand the difference between the motor and the battery and the range. So most electric bikes have a range of about uh, anywhere from 30 to 80 miles by using pedal assist and throttle. Now, obviously, since there are pedals on the bike, you can technically go infinity length on the bike. It just depends on how much you want to pedal. But most e-bikes are incredibly heavy. Some of these fat tire e-bikes, you know, are in the 70 to 90 pound range, which is very heavy. And it's a lot more difficult to pedal a 90 pound e-bike than it is a 10 pound, 20 pound, you know, Schwinn road bike. And that's okay. It's plenty of mileage to get you from where you need to go and back in most bike ride situations. Once again, you can technically go as far as you want, but look at the, the battery and where it can take you. It all depends on the incline, the weight, the terrain, even the wind. If you're going to get into the wind or, or get your back to the wind, that's what that all, that all matters. Number four, only a couple companies make the components. The truth is only a couple of different companies make tires, only a couple of different companies make shifters, only a couple of different companies make batteries, so only a couple of different companies make motors. And so put all that together and guess what? You end up with bikes that are very similar. Doesn't this e-bike look a lot like this e-bike? Or this e-bike look a lot like this e-bike? It's because most of these e-bikes are made from very similar components and the entire game around electric bikes is just branding. What brand do you like? What brand can you identify with? Which one has the most marketing dollars? Which one spends the most? Which one do you see the most ads from? But the couple of big name brands that I've found that I really like and I, I support without any, any qualms or, or reservations, I like Red Power Bikes, I like Aventon, I like Ride One Up. Those are very reputable brands that you will not have any problems with whatsoever. Most of the other e-bikes, frankly, you won't have a problem with either. But the biggest and most expensive part of any e-bike is the battery. Let's talk about that for just a second. Number five, all about batteries. Let's talk about batteries. So the batteries are all made up from very similar components. Of course, they all take very different shapes and sizes. And in some case, look at this battery and look at this battery. They look very similar, don't, don't they? Well, the problem is, is of course, they make proprietary connectors, which connect to the battery, but there's ways around that. Um, you can look up different tutorials on how to use different connectors with different batteries. So I won't spend time doing that here. But most batteries are either LG or Samsung cells. Think of it as like a bunch of like AA, AAA batteries stacked inside of one of these things. That's the best way I can understand it. And they're just full of the same cells with a different case different wiring. Of course, they have to to make it proprietary so that they can't be switched out. But that's honestly one of the number one concerns I think about when I'm looking at an e-bike is what happens if the battery goes dead? And I love this e-bike. That's why I like the big brands I just mentioned, like Aventon, Ride Power Bikes, Ride One Up. They are well-funded. They've got a good support base. And I don't think they're going anywhere. And so I don't have any problems trusting them because I know the battery and they can range from like three to seven or 800 bucks, depending on which model you have. That's what I'm most concerned about for life of an e-bike. 
I have e-bikes that I have used for four or five years now and had no problems with any of them, knock on wood. But that's the number one concern, making sure you can find a replacement battery for your electric bike. Number six, what to know about motors. Okay, let's talk about motors for just a second. There's three main types of motors. There is front drive, which means the motor is in the front wheel. There is mid drive, which means the motor is in the middle of the bike or where the crankshaft is. And there is rear hub motors. Most of the electric bikes that you see online are rear hub motors. There are some pros and cons to each one of these, so let's walk through it super quick. Front hub motors are one of the easiest motors to put on a regular bike. I've seen lots of people with, you know, kind of ghetto versions of this. They put the front hub motor attached to a battery and it works. The Rad Power Bike Trike is the first e-bike that I've tested that has a front motor built into the bike. And that's just because it doesn't require two rear motors. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with the front motor. It just kind of gives the feeling that you're being pulled versus being pushed, which is what a rear hub motor is all about. Now let's talk about the mid-drive motors. Now mid-drive motors are more reliable. They last longer. And frankly, they're also just more expensive and that's okay. But if you are a serious, and I mean serious biker, look into a mid-drive motor. The biggest one that I have tested is the Quiet Cat Apex. It has a mid-drive motor. But for most people, it just introduces another level of complexity they don't want to deal with. And what I mean by that is with the rear hub motor, there are no gears for the rear hub. You simply go or you don't. But with a mid hub motor, you have to think about, okay, am I adjusting pedal assist? Am I adjusting the different gears? Because a different pedal assist at a different gear level makes the bike run differently. And so it's a really tough balance between figuring out what is the best for your riding conditions, but also having to think through all of it, to be honest with you. I don't tend to use the different gears in the rear hub motors. I use the pedal assist levels as my different gears. So if I'm going somewhere up a hill and I need a lot of support, I bump up the pedal assist level. I don't mess with the gears all that much on the rear hub motors. Now the rear hub motors are less expensive, they also don't last as long. Knock on wood once again, I have not had any types of problems whatsoever with the rear hub motors at all, but some people have, and they just don't last as long as the mid-drive motors. That's what most of the e-bikes are. They're rear hub, and to be honest with you, they work great. They're just kind of the regular man's version of an electric bike. Number seven, pedal assist and throttle. Let me break up for just a second and talk about pedal assist and throttle. Most people don't know that electric bikes have both pedal assist and a throttle. Let me explain what they mean super quick. So throttle is exactly what you think they are. You push a button, you turn a handlebar twist and you go just like you would on a motorcycle or anything else. There's no gears typically, unless it's a mid-drive motor, which I'll talk about here in just a second, but you just twist the throttle and you go. And that is throttle. Class one e-bikes, like I talked about, do not have a throttle. Class two and class three typically do have a throttle. There is also pedal assist. Now pedal assist is that extra umph you get every time you turn. And there's two main kinds of pedal assist functions. There is the pedal assist that is a cadence sensor and there's pedal assist that is a torque sensor. So a cadence sensor, think of it as like little magnets on the inside of your crankshaft. And every time that magnet sensor hits the magnet reader, it basically tells the motor, Hey, give this, give this bike some extra push. And that's exactly what it does. And it does a really great job. The downfall of that is that sometimes it can feel a little artificial, especially in a higher pedal assist level when you're going really slow. So if you're just starting out, 
and you have it, you know, let's say something has five levels of pedal assist, you have it on pedal assist level five, and you turn the crankshaft just a little bit, it can feel like that, uh, uh, the bike moving forward very quickly. And most e-bikes, if you have it down on pedal assist level one or two, it's barely noticeable, but that's what causes that, whoa, that, that really quick movement forward. Nothing wrong with it. Some people actually prefer that, but it can be a little bit touchy and a little bit sensitive. The next is a more expensive option. It's called torque sensing. And the best way I can describe a bike with torque sensing pedal assist is that the bike feels like you are Lance Armstrong or that you have superhuman legs. And just every turn that you make, every push of the pedal is exponential compared to what the forces you actually put into it. The torque sensor is exactly like what it sounds. The amount of energy and torque that you put on the crankshaft is matched in really good torque sensors exactly the way that you, you gave it and just gives you more of what you already put in. So once again, cadence sensor is more of that like super sensitive, like you can move it just like a quarter of an inch and take off. And a torque sensor is not gonna do that. If you give a little bit of power, it's going to give a little power back. And if you give a lot of power, it's going to give a lot of power back. Does that make sense? Number eight, electric bike range. Let's talk about range for just a second. Most electric e-bikes have a range of somewhere from 25 to 85 miles that it's advertised that the bike will go on pedal assist and throttle. Now that is a giant, giant disclaimer. There should be so many red flags on that, that a bike that says it goes 85 miles and you know, probably would not be able to go 85 with just using throttle. But you know, the bigger the battery, the more it's gonna be able to go and also the heavier it's gonna be. So there's always trade-offs with that. I would anticipate that most electric bikes get, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 miles on a full, charge and so it's a great you know range uh, most people think they need way more than that they get range anxiety and technically every single electric bike that you see has unlimited range as long as you can keep on pedaling right and so people get range anxiety quite a bit but you know most people are not going for 30 mile bike rides on a given weekend most people want electric bikes to go to the brewery to have some fun with their friends to go you know run errands whatever but there are e-bikes that have larger batteries and therefore can go longer and so the number one thing to think about is just once again how are you going to use your electric bike if you're only going to be going 10 15 miles you can work with the lower capacity battery it's just that simple. If you need to go a longer range, there are several e-bikes with dual batteries, larger batteries. You can always take your battery where you're going, plug it in when you get there. There are so many different options. Once again, it all comes back to how are you gonna use your electric bike? More weight on the bike, either through yourself or through you know, carrying any cargo with you is going to make a giant difference going uphill have the wind at your back all those things make a ton of difference when it comes to your overall range number nine different types of batteries let's talk about different batteries now as i mentioned most batteries are lg or samsung cells inside the tough part is that they are almost all different when it comes to the ability to plug one battery into another. A lot of that is due to form factor, that's just due to being proprietary. But even though all battery cells are usually the same, the connection to power the bike are usually different, so they're not interchangeable at all. It's a good thing to know and why I recommend reputable brands that have been around for a while. And people ask, okay, well, what does it take to charge a battery? Well, you use, it basically comes with a laptop charger is the best way I can explain it and it takes about four to five hours to get you know 80 to 90 percent full that last you know 10 20 percent takes another couple hours and just charge like you would a cell phone you don't keep your cell phone charged all day every day if you're using it or not i tell people 
you know, if you get done with the ride, plug it in, charge up to full, unplug it. So it's not say plugged in. I, once again, knock on wood, have not had any issues at all with different kinds of batteries. And so I would just use that advice. Keep it plugged in when it's empty. Once it's full, unplug it, put it away and also store it inside. You know, if you live in 65 degree weather all the time, that's probably okay in your garage, but most of us don't. So in extreme heat or extreme winter, just bring it inside, plug it in for a couple hours and then unplug it when it's full. It's really just that simple. Number 10, bike height and comfort. Let's talk about height and comfort really quick. As I mentioned from the very beginning, there is no such thing as a perfect electric bike, but there is the perfect electric bike for you. The number one thing you can do with an electric bike is get one that fits you and fits you from not only just an overall riding height, but fits you from a weight that you're willing to handle. The perfect example of this is there's a lot of e-bikes out there that do not have adjustable seats. And you know what? If you're not going to pedal a whole lot, that's okay. But if you are pedaling a lot and you want to pedal a lot, then don't get a bike with a non-adjustable seat. You will not be happy about it. But the number one thing is getting a bike that you feel comfortable in and that fits your ergonomics, fits your height. And that is the best thing that I can possibly tell you about picking a bike is just get one that you feel comfortable in. It's a huge deal. Number 11, money, money, money. Now let's talk about price. Most e-bikes run anywhere from two to let's say $3,000. And as I was showing bikes to people in my garage, I realized how much the price really indicates what is the difference between a really great e-bike and a good e-bike. So for example, this Nakato Santa Monica, I think retails for like $1,199. 1200 bucks. It's a fine e-bike, but it doesn't have certain features that other higher priced electric bikes have. It does not have hydraulic disc brakes. It has a smaller battery. It has a little bit of a wonky trip computer. It doesn't make it a bad bike, but if you want to save a thousand dollars, you just want to cruise, you know, for like a mile or two at a time, then get this e-bike. It is super fun to ride. I love the comfort of it and it looks awesome. But the price will determine almost exactly how high of a quality of bike this is. Everyone makes unique design choices. They make different ideas about what they think customers are going to buy. But the truth is, like I said at the beginning, they're all very similar components, very similar things that they share in common. And so you don't need to worry about is this e bike better or worse? Just look for an electric bike that has all the components you need and the price will pretty much tell you how high of a quality bike it is if you see a 700 dollars e-bike i'd probably pass on it uh, you know a thousand dollars about the least i would spend but you can find some crazy sales too number 12 other components all right let's talk about a couple of the other components that do make a huge difference when i first tested out electric bikes they all came with mechanical disc brakes. I didn't know anything about brakes or anything like that when I was first starting out, and that's okay. I don't expect you to either. But there is also what's called hydraulic disc brakes, mechanical and hydraulic. Hydraulic uses, like the name sounds, a hydraulic piston to close the brake, and it's self-fixing, self-correcting, self-tightening, and it just makes a giant difference in the bike experience. So if you see a really cheap e-bike that looks great, it probably has mechanical disc brakes. There's nothing wrong with mechanical disc brakes. I've just been super spoiled since testing out all the new e-bikes that have now hydraulic disc brakes. Hydraulic disc brakes last longer. They don't require as much tuning. They don't squeak when you first get them. And overall, they're a better brake. They had some challenges shipping them at very first on some of the early electric bike models, but they don't have that problem anymore. They fixed most of that. They are slightly more expensive, but that is a huge upgrade that I recommend everyone look at with your electric bike. 
Number 13, what does it matter? The next thing that people probably over index on, but they probably shouldn't, is the computer. I can't tell you how little I use the trip computer. I use it to look at what my pedal assist level is and occasionally look at what my distance is. But there are apps and there's some e-bikes that sync with different apps. I don't care for that. I and I don't care if my bike connects with an app or not. I have my Apple smartwatch that allows me to, you know, track my workouts, check my bike rides, so I don't really need it. And people really tend to over-index on the computer or the controller for the electric bike. Don't do that. Make sure you can read it, make sure you can see it, and make sure you know how to use it. And that's about it. There's full color ones, but I don't like those because polarized sunglasses tend to make them really hard to read. I tend to like really simple, big block, old school LCD, not LED, LCD displays that show things in big block letters so I can see it real quickly as I'm riding. And yeah, just, just don't try and get an iMac on your electric bike, okay? That, that's basically it. Number 14, the best part about an e-bike. The best thing about riding an electric bike, this has been true of every person that I have seen ride an electric bike for the very first time, even if it's not the greatest electric bike. They pull it in the driveway with a giant smile on their face. Now, unless you get a complete clunker, a lemon, whatever, you can't go wrong with so many of the different electric bikes that are out there on the market. Find one that fits you. Find one that does things you want to do. One thing I haven't talked about is if you're gonna go off-road, find an electric bike with a front suspension. If you wanna go crazy off-road, get a front and back suspension. Make sure that you have big fat tires if you're gonna go off-road. But if you're not, don't get the extra added weight of an hydraulic you know, front suspension or big fat tires. Once again, it all comes down to finding the right electric bike for you. Number 15, what about maintenance? Now, most people ask me, what kind of maintenance do you need? What kind of you know things do you think about? And once again, I've had my oldest electric bike for, I don't know, four or five years now. And knock on wood for like the 10,000th time, I have not had any problems whatsoever. Obviously do things like make sure it's clean, uh, make sure you, you know, oil the chain, all that kind of fun stuff, check the brakes. But other than that, they don't require a whole lot more attention to maintenance than a classic, regular, non-electric bike. And that's what I love about so many of the different bikes that are on the market. They don't require a whole lot of extra maintenance. I haven't had any issues with, with them. Once again, knock on wood, but you can't go wrong with so many of the bikes that are on the market as long as it fits you and what you're trying to do. And that's why I tell everyone, go test ride a bike, go check it out, go have a mechanic look at any bike you put together yourself. A lot of these companies save money by marketing direct to consumer. It's no different than buying something from Target where they mark up the price from the distributor, the distributor marks the price and send it to, to Target, Target marks up the price and send it to you. Buying these bikes direct to consumer means that you can put it together and they've done a really great job and it's improved so much. Anyone can put it together in an electric bike if you can put together a, I don't know, Ikea bunk bed. If you can put together an Ikea bunk bed, you can put together an electric bike. You can do it, it's pretty easy, but please, 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 especially if you have a class three e-bike going 28 miles an hour, make sure to have a mechanic look at it. If you have an electric bike that has kids hanging on the back, make sure to have a mechanic look at it it will give you peace of mind. They will find things you've done incorrect or maybe the instructions weren't clear on, and that's okay. That's why they have their job. There's different companies that will even come directly to your home and look at them for you so you don't have to ride it somewhere else. But I highly, highly recommend you have someone look at your electric bike that is certified as a professional bike mechanic so you don't just leave it up for chance. Going 20 miles an hour or 28 miles an hour is fast, especially on a bike, and especially if you're not used to it. So just be careful, be safe. 
Here are the helmets that we recommend. And I'll put a link to that down below and uh, in the cards here. But, and I'll also put a link to the best accessories. Once again, it's all about finding the best electric bike for you. Number 16, final thoughts. In conclusion, what did you learn? What do you think that is the right electric bike for you? Put it in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to give you my opinion, especially if I've tested it out or what to think about it. There are new e-bike brands coming out every day, which makes it next to impossible to put this overview together and have it not be dated the second it comes out. But I hope I gave you something to think about. Once again, there is no perfect e-bike, but there is probably the perfect e-bike for you. So as long as you're realistic, you don't want a five pound you know, mountain bike with big fat giant tires that goes for 2000 miles on a single charge, you can find the right bike for you. There's all trade-offs. Every new feature, every new thing adds functionality, but it also adds weight. So that's something to think about as well. Just find the right e-bike that works for you. And I guarantee you're gonna be like everyone else that test rides an electric bike for the very first time. They're gonna pull into to the driveway. You're gonna pull off to the side of the road and just have a giant smile on your face. And that's the whole point. Do you have any questions or comments about this or anything else we've talked about? Please let us know in the comments below. And I hope to see you again real soon.